It's time for a wellness time revolution. For wellness brought revolution. Brought to you by Hotsi Health and Wellness Center. Honest discussion on maintaining health and wellness naturally to enjoy a better quality of life. He's the doctor fighting to let you keep your doctor. Now, Dr. Stephen Hotsi. Dr. Hotsi's Wellness Revolution podcast is brought to you by Physicians Preference Pharmacy, formerly Hotsi Pharmacy. Welcome to Dr. Hotsey's Wellness Revolution. I'm Stacey Banfield here with Dr. Stephen Hotsey, founder of the Hotsey Health and Wellness Center. We've got such a great show for you today. So excited uh, about this. A lot of people struggle with addiction. Maybe you struggle with addiction or know other people who have. And so the thoughts and ideas that are being presented on this broadcast maybe seem a little counterculture to what you've heard of before, but it's such great information. It's so eye-opening. So, so excited for you to get the information. Here's Dr. Hotsey. Thank you so much, Stacy, and thank each one of you for joining us today. You know, I believe that you and you alone are responsible for your health, and only you can determine if you want to be healthy or not. I believe that most health problems can, can be prevented. And what we do here at the Hotsey Health and Wellness Center is we help you get on a path of health and wellness naturally without pharmaceutical drugs. So as you mature, you've got energy, you've got vitality, and you're enthusiastic about life. We want to make sure that every day, and I recommend you do this every day, stand in front of a mirror and say, I'm alive, I'm awake, I'm alert, and I'm enthusiastic about life. If you're not enthusiastic, act enthusiastic, and then you'll become enthusiastic. So I'm enthusiastic about this show today because... It is going to be a great eye-opener for you all who have heard so much about drug addiction. You know, right now the big topic is opioid uh, addictions across the United States and all the people that are addicted to the various painkillers and opioid drugs and how it's killing people and it's a terrible problem because all these people are addicted and now they've got a, a lifelong problem that will never be able to be overcome and they're suing the drug companies and it's a, it's a, it's a huge mess. Well, I started doing a little bit of study in our practice. Uh, I started thinking about all the thousands of people we see. And as I read about substance abuse and addiction, I came to find out that 30% of the population, adult population, have problems with alcohol abuse, 30%. So I'm thinking in my practice, it can't be any different. 30% of the People have alcohol abuse. And then I also read where about that number of people have drug abuse problems. They're either taking too many painkillers or they're taking psychotropic drugs or who else. You, you know, the doctors pass out many of these drugs or prescribed drugs they're addicted to. And then they sell them. You know, kids sell them. They take their parents' drugs and sell them to their friends. And so there's a big... It's a real problem. It's a real problem here. So... I'm thinking if 30% of the population of the people we see at the Hotsey Health and Wellness Center have problems with substance abuse, maybe we ought to address that. And so when I thought about this, I, I, I started checking around because I have an inquisitive mind, and I began looking at various YouTubes and, and podcasts, and I ran in to, to a very unique group of individuals that – had created what is called the freedom model on drug abuse. Now, the standard thinking in in medicine in which all of us have been taught on TV and in the medical schools everywhere is that alcohol abuse and, and drug abuse is an addiction. It's a disease even that for which you need treatment. You know, you've all heard that. And that it's a lifelong problem that you're going to have and you can never get over it. Well, when I was in medical school, uh, before I took my psychiatry rotation, I read a book by Dr. Thomas Zaz, who was a Hungarian, who's a Hungarian uh, who lived in America, who wrote a book called The Myth of Mental Illness, which resonated with me because I, I had seen in psychiatry all the use of drugs and all these people had said they had this mental illness and they weren't responsible for their actions because they were mentally ill. And I just didn't buy that line. And Dr. And Dr. Zaz explained why that was myth. It took personal responsibility away from the individual. He said people have free will and they can choose what they want to do. And if they choose to do wrong, they can't hide behind the fact that they're mentally ill. That's an excuse. It's not a diagnosis. Uh, when people do things that are improper, 
or use a uh, or like drug abuse. They made a choice to do that. So I agree with that. I went into psychi, you know, I did my psychiatry rotation, and I explained my point of view to the psychiatrists. They didn't really like it, so they promptly failed me out of psychiatry and tried to kick me out of medical school here at the University of Texas. Well. I had the surgeons stand in for me, and they liked me, so I, they kept me. They let me stay in medical school. I had to repeat psychiatry, and we kind of had a truce that I wasn't going to argue with them. They were going to argue with me. We were just going to go by. I tell them I would tell them what they wanted to hear, even though they knew I didn't believe it. And so I passed and got out of med school, and the rest is history. But when I started reading the material from the Freedom Model, I grew very interested when I read and heard about this, and so. We have today on our program two very unique individuals, Mark Sheeran and Michelle Dunbar. These two individuals live in kind of mid-state New York in the in the uh, Albany area, which is which is where the government of uh, New York is seated there in Albany. So they live. <coughs> as a matter of fact, they have a uh, a uh, St. Jude treatment center uh, located about 40 miles from Albany uh, towards the Hudson River. So when I listen, and, and so Mark Sheeran's background is that he, and I'll let him talk about it, but he had a problem with substance abuse, alcohol and drugs growing up and ended up having to go through treatment and all that. And out of that, he, he decided that the treatment program really wasn't working, this whole disease model. And through the help of Michelle Dunbar's father, Jerry Brown, uh, he was introduced to a new model, the whole concept and idea that he had a free will and free choice, and he could choose not to do these things if he wanted to, and he did. And Michelle, of course, grew up with her dad, Jerry Brown, and she, she had grown up in a, in a home that had problems with alcohol abuse, and her father had overcome that, and she got involved in that and then, then came out of that. And in 1992... Michelle Dunbar and Mark Sheeran, with the help of Michelle's dad, Jerry Brown, started the Baldwin Research Institute to develop a new model of addressing substance abuse. And that was started in 92. Now, fast forward, it's almost 20 years, 20 years later, um, they have a thriving uh, center called the St. Jude uh, Retreat Center located um, outside of Albany where people go uh, to be educated, not to be treated. They don't do treatment. What they do is 180 degrees different than treatment. So on one side of the coin, current medical profession says substance abuse is a disease and should be treated like a disease with drugs and with counseling lifelong. On the other hand, you have Mark Sheeran, Michelle Dunbar, their organization and other people that follow that that say no, drug. There's no such thing as drug addiction. Now, do you do you listen to that? This is what they would say, and they're going to explain why there's no such thing as drug addiction. There's drug abuse, and there's alcohol abuse, but not an addiction because people have free will. So anyway, that's my introduction. That's why I am bringing this up because I know. If 30% of the people in the in the population have problems with some sort of substance abuse, then 30% of our listeners here on the podcast are having problems with somebody in the family or with themselves experiencing substance abuse. And I want you to listen closely to what Mark Sheeran and Michelle Dunbar have to say about the freedom model and how you can escape from the 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 use of uh, the improper and overuse of uh, substances and the misuse of substances and have a life that's normal again and you can do it yourself without having to go through huge treatment programs which invariably fail so mark take over from me tell tell us about yourself tell us about growing up how you got involved in uh, in you know substance abuse and how you got out of it and what you've created Okay. All right. Well, thank you. That was, a, that was a good, thorough introduction because most people, when we do an interview, they don't they don't do their homework, but you did. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, I want to clarify something because uh, people say, "Well, you you don't think addiction exists," and and the truth is, um, not in the way that Western culture sells it. And what I mean by that is, 
no human being is compelled from the outside, from some external force or drug, to use uncontrollably. And so the definition of addiction in Western culture is that you are compelled to use via a disease or an external means that the drug has power. And what we say is that addiction is a habit that is self-created for personal reasons and that you have control over that habit. Now, with those two definitions juxtaposed to each other, lots of people have the habit and feel addicted, I did, and feel powerless because that is what our culture teaches them to feel, and then it becomes true and what you think you are. So I had to I had to clarify that. Also, people will say, um, as you'll get a lot of criticism from the podcast if we don't clarify this, we absolutely understand about physical dependence. But physical dependence is a toxic issue, a physical toxicity issue. That's why you go to detox. Um, and But it's not addiction. It, even withdrawal does not compel somebody to use beyond their own will. So you're never powerless. That's the point of the freedom model. So, so there is no loss of control. Now, with that said, let me get into uh, my story briefly. I grew up in a, a family that was steeped in treatment. My mother was a certified alcoholism counselor who had a, a drinking problem. I have uh, eight siblings that uh, went to rehab or some form of therapy for the drinking or driving out of the 12 of us. Um, and I was the last in, all, in, in the 12 siblings that had a problem. Um, I got into a very serious car accident that made me have to look at my life because I was going to jail. And, and I also wanted to get out of my hometown and I wanted to move on with my life. And, and the courts had decided that uh, they weren't going to let me do that. Um, even though I had quit drinking after the car accident, I quit drugging and I was mandated to treat for a, a year and a half. Uh, in that treatment, I the only mission that treatment center had for me was to for me to admit that I was powerless. I refused to do so. I became a project of theirs, and over an 18-month period of attrition, they broke me mentally and emotionally until I actually believed I was powerless, when in reality I hadn't even drank for two years at that point. Um, and that experience was very similar to the propaganda that you get in a concentration camp, for instance. Now, obviously, I'm not making a direct comparison between the two because, obviously, a concentration camp is much worse. Um, that's genocide. But, but the point is, it's a, it's a quiet breaking down of one's will. And that experience inspired me to say, why do I feel worse after treatment? Right? I, I mean, the whole experience was supposed to heal me. And that, that's what their website would say. You know, it's about healing. Well, I wasn't healed. I was broken. So I said, I'm going to find a better way, and I became a researcher. I met Michelle's father, Jerry, who was a, a career researcher and who had been doing a project on exactly that topic. My life and his life coincide. We bumped into each other at exactly the right moment, became fast friends. I became his research assistant, and we launched that project. Now, that was actually 1989, so it's been 30 years since that meeting. Um, and my life changed. It took off. He showed me that uh, I wasn't powerless, that actually my instincts were correct, that I was I was not an alcoholic, I was not a drug addict, and it was okay for me to reject those labels and move on with my life. And then he showed me all the statistical analysis out there that showed from many researchers throughout the last 50 years at that time uh, that most people get past this problem. And I didn't know that. If you go to AA or you go to treatment, you're told nobody does, right. and that you need perpetual treatment. So. That's the fundamental difference and the foundation of what we do at the Freedom Model is we provide the facts, and the facts are most people get past this problem and move on from it, whether they're treated or not, to the tune of 90% or greater depending on the drug and irrespective of how bad the habit is before they decide to quit. When 9 out of 10 people, when you factor in age, move on from a problem, that's as close to a cure as you can get. So that's a natural cure. Why aren't we talking about that? And so at the Freedom Model, that's what we delved into. That became the basis of the model. Why is that? How do people do that? And then I spent 12 years living with my guests uh, at my first retreat and then did a subsequent 20 years of research thereafter. And we've helped over 8,000 people move on with their lives. So that's whew, 30 years in a nutshell. <laughs> now I'll let Michelle talk. <laughs> Michelle. 
Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a similar background. As we know, my dad is Jerry Brown. Um, he quit drinking when I was about nine or ten years old, but he was mandated to a year of AA. Um, so I grew, as I say, I grew up in what I call the cult of AA. Um, and it really did feel like that very rapidly. Every My whole life, as a child became about my dad's AA. We had strange people living in our home. We only went to sober parties. A lot of them my dad actually threw. And I was told from that age that I had an addictive personality and that if I ever touched a drink or a drug, I would be instantly addicted um, and out of control. And, and Which is an interesting thing because I had my first drink at 12, um, even though there was no alcohol in my house. Um, I tried my first drug at 12 and, um, and I wasn't, I, I, you know, I wasn't instantly addicted. I tried these things. I didn't start using drugs and alcohol regularly till I was about 16 or 17. Um, and then by then the conditioning of, you know, the ad, I had taken on the addict identity even before I ever, um, started using. So, so I followed exactly along the course that I was told I would. Um, and by 19, 20 years old, I also became diagnosed with mental illness um, with bipolar. But I was a heavy substance user at the time. And um, in the meantime, my dad had started doing his research. Um, and he was kind of doing a 180 from all the stuff he had taught me throughout my teenage years. And, um, and I went to college and was studying psychology. So the things that he had taught me were being reinforced by my professors at college um, and by the therapist I was seeing at that point in time. Um, and so when I, when I bailed out of college and went home, I was 21 years old. And my dad started telling me that there was no disease called addiction or alcoholism that I could be fine, that it was a choice. And I mean, it blew my mind. I, I thought he's totally lost his mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I, and I said, well, then why aren't you drinking? Like, if you could drink, why aren't you drinking? And he's like, well, I don't want to drink anymore. And I'm like, that sounds like a whole lot of crap to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I summarily rejected it he did his little that was he did a little intervention with me at one point which did not go well i don't recommend them um and uh so for about six months i did my own thing and then eventually when i was ready i was curious enough he had taken in uh some young men he was helping um from the program mark was one of those people and they all looked like they were having fun nobody was partying but they were all ex-partiers and um and i was curious enough that i went to him and said all right tell me about what you're doing i need to i i need to figure this out because i i watched my grandmother die of cancer so i knew the difference between you know drinking heavily and having cancer um i knew i didn't have a disease i i i felt powerless i i felt like there was something happening to me that i couldn't control um, but I knew I knew it was different than cancer, um, and so that's how I became part of the research project he was doing without knowing it. Um, but I started to to open my mind to the the, the idea that I could be okay. Um, that not only was I not powerless over substances, but maybe I wasn't. Maybe this whole bipolar diagnosis wasn't accurate either. Maybe there was no such thing. Even though that's what I'd studied. I'd studied, you know. Uh, mental illness. I, I, you know, I, but I knew that there was, that there was something not right about it because I knew if I don't have control, then there's, then there's no hope. And so I vacillated between feeling completely hopeless and suicidal um, to feeling hopeful and like maybe, maybe I do have control and I can make my life better. And thankfully, um, the more I researched it, the more I read, the more I stuck around, the more I learned just how much control I had. Well, that's both of you have just shared remarkable stories now of how you decided on your own to stop substance abuse, whether it was alcohol or drugs or both. Right. You just decided to do it. 
and without being treated. It was it. You, but it, it, you weren't treated. You were educated. Somebody explained to you. That was, of course, Michelle's dad, Jeff Brown, explained to you through the research that you're responsible for your own actions, and you can make a choice if you want to. Now, my understanding from from uh, the Freedom Model is that you have three main pillars that you you all promote in opposition to the disease treatment rehab AA model that uh, our current uh, medical profession and society advocates, and that's the the pillars of free will mental autonomy, and positive drive principles. So could you explain what you mean by those when you write about those? Yes, of course. Uh, one of the things that I did in the research and what I spent the last 30 years really studying is what motivates human beings. If I could understand what intrinsically motivates human beings from birth, I could maybe understand why people took the risky choices they took. And uh, what what... 30 years of research proved is that people choose, were choosers, were problem-solving creatures, and there was a tremendous amount of, of uh, research behind the fact that as human beings, uh, we move in the direction of our current most dominant thought. And so that was free will, that we could choose. We could choose our destiny. We could choose whether to drink uh, a fifth of vodka a day or not. Even if we had withdrawal and even if we were struggling, um, people stopped. And, and, and we're able to choose. So we're, so we're choosers. That's right. free in a nutshell. And then mental autonomy is this idea that I exhibited when the treatment centers were trying to tell me that I was this powerless, hapless victim, and I was rejecting that. That's an example of mental autonomy, where uh, I am my own person with my own thoughts and my own capabilities within my own mind. And that's how God made us, you know? Um, we have this ability to be an individual and think for ourselves. And then, of course, the positive drive principle, I think, is the crowning jewel of our research, really, which is understanding that uh, people are always moving in the direction of what makes them happy at any given moment. Now, those choices may be risky. They may be uh, they may end in different uh, uh, terrible consequences, you know, um, but on the front end of a decision, any decision we make, we are always trying to find a happier position in our life. So we're driven by the pursuit of happiness. And a good example of that, of course, is drinking lots of beer. On the front end, I want to have the buzz. I want to have the excitement. I want to have the socialization. I want to have a... But on the other end is a hangover, the possible car wreck. Maybe I kill a family in a car wreck. I mean, there's there's consequences down the line. So, so it's very important to understand with positive drive principle that... Even though we're looking for a happier perspective in life, sometimes we choose for it. Um, so, but, but it's also important that if we're choosing for the pursuit of happiness, we are choosing for ourselves. You know, And that's why education is so important and understanding what your options are. If you can choose freely, if you're your own person, that means that you can choose for yourself. And you can also analyze your pursuits of happiness for better outcomes. And really, if you take those three things, that's what we teach at our retreat, for example, or in our private instruction over Skype. I do that. I do these lessons. Michelle teaches. We all teach. Uh, Stephen Slate, the other the other author, uh, also teaches these things. So those are the pillars, and then and then all the research is woven through those three pillars to show that you can change your mind, that you can change your preference for heavy use to maybe moderate, adjust, or abstain. In my case, I abstained for about 20 years, and then I, now I socially drink. I don't take drugs because I have no interest in it. Um, Michelle had the same experience. She moder you know, she moderates. I, I wouldn't even call it moderation. I just say we drink socially every once. So, so it's uh, so those are the three pillars. Well, that that's really key, and that is juxtaposed to the addiction treatment disease rehab AA model which says that you have no free will because the drug has taken over your life or you're born with a gene. You know, if 30% of the population has problems with substance abuse of one sort or another, whether it's drugs uh, or whether it's alcohol, that means everybody in America knows somebody in their family that has or is abusing alcohol or drugs. 
And so that's why people say, well, you know, it run, oh, Uncle Bob, he drank a lot, and his son, Bob Jr., you know, he's a drinker too. It runs in the family, you know. So you got to be careful because that's your mama's brother. And, you know, your brother, he's a pretty heavy drinker too. He probably got the same gene. So, so all of a sudden you've got this gene that you don't have any control over, and you're told that it's a genetic problem, which really absolves you of responsibility. You can say, well, shoot, I just drink because I got a gene to drink. You know, Uncle Bob used to drink a lot, and Mom had his genes, and that's why we're drinking, you know. And so everybody goes, well, like, well you know why Bob drinks a lot? He's got, he's got granddaddy's gene, you know, and granddaddy drank a lot too, so that's why they all, that whole family drinks. So we got to be careful. And, they, and so Bob, by, by saying, well, it's in the genes, it kind of takes the edge off his personal responsibility. People don't like him drinking so much, but he's got an excuse. So in some way, and then the other thing he does, if he's told it's in the genes or he told he's had a disease, uh, it's, it puts you in a hopeless situation because mm-hmm. you go like, I can't get over this. And so that would tend to make a person hopeless or depressed. So tell us the difference between – between your model, the freedom model, and you all have treated over the last 30 years, how many people have come through your program? Approximately 100, 1,000, 5,000, how many? A little over 8,000 now. 8,000 8, have come through your program. Yeah. And I yeah. bet a lot of them had tried the other conventional rehab places first, right, before they found you? Yeah, all, most people that come to our retreat have been to two or more treatment programs. And they failed at those treatment programs because what do those tre- treatment programs make them say about themselves? Well, first, it's my experience, and that is the first thing you have to do is identify as someone who's powerless over a drug. See, what they did philosophically and, and actually explicitly as well is they took the power out of a human, which is infinite ability of free will, right? We can choose in anything. We can choose any direction of our lives. And they took that out of the human and they put it in the bottle and the drug. I think about how we talk about drugs. We talk about them as powerfully addictive. Right. Well, a drug doesn't think. It's not a virus. It's not It's not out bent on your destruction. It doesn't come in your body and, 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 and take over the tissue like a real virus actually does. There's, there's no genetic code that uh, forces you to think about, I want alcohol. So there's, there's all these myths that treatment has been perpetuating, and the question I posed is why. Now, having grown up in a family steeped in treatment, I knew why. It was money. I mean, if you can make somebody a minion uh, where they always need your solution and they're dependent on treatment, like, you know, then you got a paying customer for life. Now, yes. I don't... No, that hey, let me let me interrupt you on that and say I totally agree with that. And as I analyze, see, you know, I bought into the old system myself. I heard about it. You know, I heard friends. Well, I went to AA, and some of them quit drinking. And and you know, I have a friend and relative that goes, I've been, I I, I quit drinking. I've been an alcoholic for thirty years, and I quit drinking. Um, and so I'm thinking, well, that must be a pretty good situation, really, until I started hearing people that had been in AA tell me what they say. And this is what is really frightening to me, because I believe what you think about yourself, you become. So tell me, in an AA meeting, how do people introduce themselves? <laughs> Hi, I'm Michelle, and I'm an alcoholic, and <laughs> which every day, and you're just going to meetings every day, and there are people in the meetings that tell you, remind yourself every morning that you're powerless over alcohol. No. That you're powerless. Now, think about that. What a negative affirmation that is. I'm telling myself every day that I'm an alcoholic and I'm powerless. And I can't do anything about it. Of course, they say, well, you can go to a higher power, whoever you think that higher power is, and he's going to help you. And, and I don't mean to dismiss the fact as a Christian, we ought to put our confidence in Christ, and Christ can help us overcome our problems. But at the same time, if I keep telling myself I'm a wretched drunk, I'm an alcoholic, and I, I there's nothing I can do about it except if a higher power comes in, 
And God has given us free will, and he does give, give us power to overcome things, but he gives us the choice. It's our choice to do right or to do wrong. And so we can make a choice to drink or not to drink, to take drugs or not to drink drugs. And you would say the reason people make that choice not to use substance abuse is because their positive drive principle says they can be happier not using the drugs than using the drugs. Is that right? That's right. That's exactly correct. What, what we try to do with people is give them the facts, debunk the myths first. So you have to get rid of the, the mythology because that's what holds you back, right? The untruth. And then after that, it's about how do you make a preference change? Your, your drink, your, your desire for drink and drugs is, is a preference that you've developed over time for very personal reasons. And, and it becomes habitual. It becomes very painful. I get that. And, and there may even be some physical dependence wrapped up in that. But what, what the whole point is, is um, to change the preference through looking at it and saying, can I be happier using it less? You know, I, I really dislike, I'll give you an example, I really dislike uh, seafood bisque. Can't stand it. Just <laughs> he really, really hates he it. He dislikes what? <laughs> what did you say? Seafood bisque. I hate seafood bisque. Oh, oh. seafood bisque. Yes, so, so I don't have to go to meetings to stop myself from eating seafood this, <laughs> you know? And and so the reason that this whole treatment structure abounds is because people can't say, hey, I like getting drunk and high at this level. I prefer it. And and maybe I need to analyze why that is. Right. So the thing that we do at the Freedom Miles, we take away the judgment about your use. We say one of our first classes is what are the benefits of getting drunk and high at the level that you do it? And then let's ask, after we've analyzed all those benefits and challenged them, uh, could you be happier using it less? And let's, let's look at the results of that. And people, when they really look at it, um, and you go through this analysis over the period of a couple of weeks, they... they Six out of ten of them stop. I mean, they just move on with their lives. And another 15% will moderate, and the other 15% will continue to drink and drug heavily. Okay, so, so you you have what percent of the people, of the 8,000 people, you all have done studies on this, and I've read some of those studies that you've done on your people in follow-up. What percent eliminate uh, their substance abuse altogether? 62.5%. Okay. And that wasn't us doing the studies. That was three independent companies. Independent studies done. So 62.5% that come there quit. And then what percent moderate? Uh, and this is more approximate because we haven't done studies, but all indications are that it's 15%, somewhere around 15 So 15% moderate, and then that leaves, what, another 20% or so that just don't... They, they, they continue to use the substances. Yeah. Yes, problematic. Okay. Now, how does that – so let's go, to, let's go to AA, and let's just make a comparison. In AA, have they done any studies about people at AA and how many people go to AA and what percent of the people completely eliminate drinking altogether for any period of time? So, you know, you're, when, when we t- talked about your study, what, what period of time are we talking about? When you say 62.5% quit drinking, is that in a six-month follow-up or a year follow-up or two-year, three-year? What would that be? It was a random sample, so it was anywhere between a day after the program all the way at that point when we had done it 18 years. Okay. Yep. So what about what about the AA program or any of these rehab programs, of which there are a plethora around the country? I mean, they popped up. Once Obamacare mandated that businesses had to pay for quote unquote mental health problems they had to offer that and now that drug abuse and alcohol abuse is considered a mental health disease so they had to cover that so there was a huge amount of insurance and all of a sudden these rehab centers popped up all over the country so what percent of people that go to AA alcohol anonymous what percent of those people uh, are able to stop drinking completely have you got any statistics on that that, that's a tough one. Um, AA estimated, their own estimates suggest about 5% of the people stay in AA for a period of one year. Uh, 50% leave within the first 30 days. Um, and so 
And out of the 5% that go, keep going to meetings, that's all they've measured, there's a certain percentage of them that are continuing their problematic substance use. Um, because, you know, exposure to 12-step um, dogma or belief system actually increases it binge usage. And suicide. Yeah. So, so it's, AA estimates 5% stick around. Um, out of those that stay sober, it's, it's probably half of that. Okay. So you so you're you're low rates, uh, like two, two to three percent. Yeah, and when they compare twelve-step modalities to to brief intervention, there are all the different types of therapies, CBT, and they found the rates uh, on a scale. Uh, twelve-step indoctr disease-based indoctrination had the lowest success rate of all therapies tested. Yes. Okay, and it re it rehab centers. Rehab centers usually, I don't know, how long would, when, when somebody goes to rehab, what is the average, what is the average time that the rehab center says you need to stay? Well, uh, is it a month or two months or three months? How, how long? Yeah, it's, it's about 28 days. It's a four week insurance based scenario. So okay. So the insurance companies pay for that. Yeah. And, and when they go, what percent of the people stay for the full four weeks? Oh, only 40%. They have a 40% retention rate, meaning so, they, only 40, 4 out of 10 people complete for 28 days. So 60 people leave. Right. I mean, 60% 60 60 of the people right. leave without completing it. Correct. So, so that doesn't speak very well for that model. No, it's abysmal. Our, our rate uh, hovers between 85 and 90% and has since day one. And then, That, that <laughs> stay for how long? Yeah, how long is that? That's four to six weeks. Okay. And, uh, well, so statistically, you guys have a much better result with yeah, the people you see. And you're seeing people that have, have so-called backslidden, let's say, or who, who have fallen off the wagon from these other programs that come to you all. So you're getting two or three-time losers that come to you, and you rescue them. Yeah, we, we call ourselves I, the ambulance at the bottom of the hill. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, this is this is why when I learned about what you did in, in the in the realm of uh, substance abuse, I, it resonated with me because here at the Hotsey Health and Wellness Center, most of the guests that we see have been to conventional doctors for their health problems, whether it was for fatigue or weight or inability to focus or think clearly or sleep well or joint muscle extra, extra pains or sluggish bowels or regular menstrual periods or in, infertility. You yeah. know, and men have lost their attentiveness, assertiveness, sense of well-being, self-confidence, moods, goal orientation, and drive. They've seen a bunch of doctors for these. They've been put on all kinds of drugs, and I do believe that all drugs are poisons. What I found was interesting in reading about this is that people that go to the conventional treatment centers, disease centers, rehab centers for alcohol abuse are put on benzodiazepines. They're put on like they're put on Xanax and Ativan and. and and diazepam, which we know are can be easily abused. It's just trading one abuse for, for another, another abuse, which do have some psychotropic effects on these people. So it, it's, it's a model that you described initially where these individuals w that have substance abuse, they, have, they're, they are abusing substances. They're not addicted. There's two models. If you're addicted, you have no choice. It's a disease, right? Right. If it's substance abuse, you have a choice. You have chosen to abuse substances, whether it's drugs or alcohol. And those are two diametrically uh, opposed models. One of them is very popular in the United States, just like conventional medicine is, and that is the disease drug treatment model because it makes a fortune for the rehab centers. Yeah, $36 and, billion dollars a year. And... and and guess what? It's paid for by insurance. So why why we and and I know in your model you all are not a you're not a treatment center. You're an education center. So people have to come to you. They pay cash. They don't you don't take insurance. That's correct. So because they take cash, people go like, well, why would I go someplace where I have to pay cash, and when I can get my insurance to cover it? Because you can get well. They can right. teach well, you how to. They can teach you how to get well. So you. are you're well the rest of your life, and you're not going to be a you're not going to be a slave to your addiction the rest of your life. You're going to be a free individual. 
that's what resonates with me about your uh, your method. Now, I understand that uh, because you don't take insurance, obviously, you have to market for this. You get a lot of people coming, but marketing involves going on line and being on Facebook and Instagram and all these various models. Now, tell me, tell me what it, it, at one time you all dominated that pretty well. What is, what has happened recently? You told me that you've had some, there's been some, uh, you've experienced some difficulties, let's say with some of the providers of social, of, uh, social media. When uh, Obamacare passed and then you had these, uh, you know, they had to pay for, uh, insurance has now had to pay for treatment giant conglomerates began to form um and i shouldn't probably say who they yeah, are yeah. we won't we won't disparage anybody sure well there's there's a lot of conglomerates and they built all these rehab centers they and then they start and now and they, they started to market then they started to market and they priced this out of the marketplace um you know kind of like what walmart does when walmart comes in and they and they you know systematically can undercut all the mom and pop shops in the area sure. I'm not, I'm not, you know, disparaging Walmart, but, but that's basically what happened is, um, treatment became such a, a money driven industry at that point because there was, and now it's even getting bigger because the government's throwing a lot more money at it. So, um, and now it's become a pharmaceutical thing as well. Um, and as we know, we definitely c couldn't compete with the big money that pharmaceuticals use to market. Um, and so it systematically priced us out of the market. This is the way, this way, when, when things seem inexplicable, who has all the money? The pharmaceutical companies and all these rehab centers. They drive up the cost of, uh, of marketing through the social media. And individuals that don't adopt the insurance model, we don't either. At the OT Health and Wellness Center, we don't do insurance. We never have done insurance. We have a, we have a real novel concept. When we provide a service or product for you, you pay us just like when you go to a restaurant or when you go to you go to Macy's or for clothing or you go to get a new tire, you pay it. You just pay for it with cash, and that way we're not controlled by insurance companies. We're not controlled by the government. We're not controlled by conventional medicine. We can do what we feel is best for our guests who are our patients, and that's what you all do. You have a niche market of people that are willing to invest in their health to regain and restore their health and to quit abusing substances. That's why I'm a big advocate of the freedom model. And I don't know anybody in the entire country that does it better than the St. Jude Treatment Center in New York. There's nobody that, I mean, they are the ones that created the freedom model. And there's other people that have tried to adopt the name, but they really, and even some of the insurance-based companies have tried to adopt this, but they really don't do it the way uh, the way that uh, St. Jude Retreat Center does and the way Mark Sheeran and Michelle Dunbar do it there. So tell us, if somebody, and I know we're talking to some people out there, I know some of you out there are having a problem with substance abuse, alcohol or drugs, or you have family members that are, and you have probably tried or uh, to go to rehab centers, and failed, more than likely, or your family members have gone and they failed, and you've gone several times. So now you're willing to think maybe that's not working, okay? And if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, you know what you're going to get, the same thing. If you expect to get different results by doing the same thing, you know, that's a form of insanity, so to speak. Although I don't believe in insanity, but it's a form of insanity, Anybody that would do that, that about comes as close to insanity. It's keep doing the same thing over and over, thinking I'm going to get a different result. So, as at the Hotsey Health and Wellness Center, when people have their health problems and they've tried all these conventional doctors and they don't do well, they make a decision to do a 180 and take charge of their health and uh, try to take natural approaches to getting themselves healthy and well. They make a free will decision. Nobody puts a gun to their head. They decide, I'm not going to go the insurance route anymore because it's failed me. And those doctors work for the insurance companies and for the hospitals. They don't work for me. I want a doctor that will help me find out what the underlying cause of my problem is and then show me how to get there naturally to resolve it so that I have, I'm instead of just surviving, I'm thriving. Well, this is what they do at the St. Jude Retreat Center. 
they help people who want to do a 180 and take charge of themselves and want to see that they have free will, that they have mental autonomy, they got a they got a positive drive principle and that they this resonates that they can make a change in their life that will improve the quality of their life by eliminating their substance abuse so they no longer abuse substances doesn't mean they never have a drink ever again in their life but probably most of them don't you know they you know once you've been burned you say i just don't think i'm going to do that anymore just why because i just don't want to so they can help you do that at the saint jude center and this is what i recommend from everything i've read i would say they're the premier leaders in the field not only here in the united states but uh worldwide they're the ones that develop the model so if you have family members or yourself you're having a problem I would recommend that you contact the St. Jude uh, Retreat Center. Now, how do they do that? How do, uh, where do they go to find information about St. Jude? We have we have a website, which is SoberForever, all spelled out, dot .net. SoberForever.net. Correct. That, that talks about our retreat. Um, or they can call 888 888- Four two four two six two six, and talk with us directly. Tell us that number again. Eight 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 four two four two six two six. Eight 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 four two four two six two six, and you'll see this on the screen, so you'll know that. And it's the St. Jude Retreat Center. Okay, what about YouTube, so they can be educated about uh, what you do? Uh, yep. I saw you on YouTube. So how would they? Where should they, what should they Google to find you on YouTube? They can Google the Freedom Model. Okay. We have, and they can subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is called the Freedom Model. Okay, so you could go to, if if you typed in on Google, YouTube Freedom Model, your videos would come up. Yes. The Freedom Model. Yep. Yep. I'm sorry? The Freedom Model. Correct. YouTube.Freedom Model? Yep. Okay. So... There's a way you can take a listen and, and to listen to what Mark and uh, Michelle have to say, and Steve Slate, who also works with them, may be on though. But I think that would be very important for you to do that, and I would highly recommend it. Now, look, this is a cash base. It's not it's not inexpensive to go there. But what could be you know if you've got a family member or yourself you're having problems, or you've got friends that have problems, the best investment they can make is getting themselves back on track. And uh, this group, the uh, St. Jude Retreat Center with Mark Sheeran and Michelle Dunbar and the Baldwin Research Institute, they can help you get yourself on a path of health and wellness naturally. And by the way, since since it's not a treatment, this never goes on any public records anywhere. It's an educational institute. That's a huge, huge point. Can Can I make a couple of points, Steve? Sure. Um, the the uh, we're the only truly confidential program in existence because we're not treating somebody. So there's no health record. We don't keep records. When people come here, we're we're legitimately not treating you. Um, if you want detox for medical treatment for withdrawal, that happens somewhere else. We usually recommend Gallus Detox Centers in, in Arizona. They're the best of what they do. Um, If you need psychiatric care while you're here, let's say you have some issue, some very specific issue that you feel a psychiatrist is necessary, that would go with Dr. Bob Flynn, whom we've worked with for 25 years. But when it comes to the substance use issue, we have have literally uh, worked with this for 30 years and looked at all the research and, and, and helped thousands of people. So I want families to know that there's a way for their family member, their friend, their loved one, or themselves to get out of the trap. You feel trapped. I felt trapped. I know she felt trapped. Stephen felt trapped. And that's why in the book, The Freedom Model for Addictions, we call it Escape the Treatment and Recovery Trap. Um, and that's the last point I want to make is that if, if you uh, want to know more about what we do, buy the book. Go on Amazon. Look at the reviews. They're all five-star reviews. Those, those are all unsolicited reviews of people out in the general public that have read the book, and they want to know more about it, and they read it, and then they write a review. Again, those are unsolicited. You know, that's how Amazon works. Well, let me, I would, again, let me, let me underscore what Mark just said. Go to Amazon 
and buy the book, The Freedom Model. Buy that book, read it, share it with family members, and get yourself or your family members, get them on a path where they're going to overcome, be able to overcome their substance abuse and return and have a normal life. That's what I want to encourage you to do, and that's why I'm bringing you this information. And we're going to start to being more inquisitive of our guests here at the OC Health and Wellness Center and begin to ask about substance abuse, which we've never d- really done. Although we see a ton of people coming in on a ton of drugs that are being, they're, <laughs> they're, they have substance abuse that's been prescribed by their doctors. We try, to, we try to do everything we can to get all our guests off pharmaceutical drugs because I believe pharmaceutical drugs are poisons and they make you sicker quicker. So we get rid of those things here at the OC Health and Wellness Center. And this is what, uh, by going to the uh, St. Jude Retreat Center in New York, I guess, how, how do they get there? What, how, from anywhere in the country, where would they go? How would they get? They have to go to New York City. Where do they go? Buffalo? How do you get there? They, if they're within you know, the Northeast, they usually drive in. But uh, if they're coming from somewhere else, it's Albany International. Flying to Albany then. Yeah. And, yeah. How, and how, how far out of Albany are y'all? Uh, half hour. Half yep. hour. Okay. And provide transportation. Okay. So uh, you just fly into Albany, get a plane yep. ticket, and set it up, and give them a call at 888-424-2626. I hope this helps you, our listeners, and gives you some hope. And I and I, I really feel, you know, in my last, I be, you know, I was on the radio for 15 years starting back in 2000. I've never talked about this issue ever on the radio because it's not been in our bailiwick. I just never thought right. about it. And, and somehow I got exposed to it, so I found it very fascinating because it re- caused me to reflect back on my time in psychiatry and uh, having known some individuals that have had problems and seen them struggle with that, once I learned about this model, this is the model I highly recommend uh, in for you all using, and I give my full endorsement. Mark? Sharon and Michelle Dunbar, thank you for a most informative, interesting, and encouraging, hopeful presentation today on the Freedom Model and how people can overcome substance abuse themselves without getting in, trapped into the disease treatment rehab model of AA. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you, thank you for having us. Yes, thank you so much for ha- uh, for being on the program today. And I think that Dr. Hoodsey hit the nail on the head. I mean, the operative word here is hope. Right. Hope and choice. And I know that this this podcast is going to give people uh, a lot of hope. And if you also want to find out more about our center, you can also reach out to us at 281-698-8698. That's 281-698-8698. Thank you for joining us here today at Dr. Hoodsey's Wellness Revolution. A special thanks to Physicians Preference Pharmacy, formerly Hotsey Pharmacy, proud sponsor of Dr. Hotsey's Wellness Revolution podcast. Information provided on this radio program is neither intended nor implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice and is not intended to replace the services of a physician, nor does it constitute a doctor-patient relationship. You should not use information from this radio program to diagnose or treat a health problem or disease without consulting with a qualified health care provider. If you have or suspect you have an urgent medical problem, promptly contact a professional health care provider or call 911. Dr. Hotze's Wellness Revolution radio program advises you to always seek the advice of a physician or other qualified health provider prior to starting any new treatment or with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Any application of the recommendations from this radio program is at the listener's discretion.